I think my first exposure to clinical human factors was when I went to a lecture in the USA as a conference run by the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, who were doing a lot of work on improving patient safety. And this lecture by two prominent American anaesthetists was expounding the virtues of doing briefings before operating sessions and how that made them go more smoothly by improving communication and teamwork with the operating theatre staff. And I recognised that I wasn't very good at communicating with my operating theatre staff, particularly in advance of an operation. And I was one of the guys who'd ask for a, a, an instrument unexpectedly in the middle of an operation and then be disappointed when they didn't have it. So I thought if we formalised briefings before every operating session, I'd actually think about what I needed, we'd think about what might go wrong, and this would improve communications and make the list go smoother. So we did it, and it did. Uh, and that was really our first human factors intervention, I think. But a few years later, Martin Bromley came to the hospital to talk about the circumstances around the death of his wife, Elaine, during induction anaesthesia, and pointed out that although they had all the technical skills necessary in that anaesthetic room, the lack of non-technical skills and training meant that they didn't actually apply them. Uh, and that was a major contribution to her death. And I realised at that point that, there was a, that the human factors, in particular non-technical skills, were much more important than just making the operating list go smoothly, but were a really critical value in emergency situations as well. Um, and looking at human factors more deeply, as I have done since, makes me realise that it's actually much wider than that. It encompasses design, it encompasses, encompasses behaviour and organisational structure. And in fact, it underpins everything that we've been doing to try and improve patient safety.